Hello and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I am Jody Grinwald. This week, my guest is Ivy Sharmitz. Ivy's an Emmy Award winning executive producer and writer. She grew up in Westfield, New Jersey, where as a child, she had thoughts of becoming a radio host. She did not realize that her decision to tell stories was really influenced by what her grandfather experienced as a Holocaust survivor. He never let that experience define him. Ivy shares how important it is to her to be able to tell people stories through her work as you never know who needs to hear their message. She talks about how women need to allow themselves to be truly authentic. When we try to fit in or become something we are not, we devalue who we truly are. We talk about vulnerability, grief, peace, connection, and how everyone we meet, we meet for a reason. Several years ago, Ivy started hashtag kind like Mike day, which occurs annually on March 28th. The day encourages people to do random acts of kindness in honor of her brother, Michael, who passed away in 2004. Please subscribe to the Today's the Day Changemakers YouTube channel. Stream this podcast on all streaming sites. Like us on Facebook and Instagram at Today is the Day Live It. I am the CEO and co-founder of the Zach Giaplutter Kids Foundation, a nonprofit organization that is making a difference in the lives of children with financial barriers who are looking for an ongoing creative connection through the performing arts. Please visit applaudourkids.org for more information. And for more information, about my coaching and consulting services, please visit todayisthedayliveit.com. Have a great week, everyone. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I am Jody Grinwald, and each week, as I always say, I get to interview the most amazing and incredible people who are making change out there, either in their corner of the world or throughout the world. And today I have our Ivy Sharmitz with me. And did I say your last name right, Sharmitz? Yes, Sharmitz. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Ivy, I am so happy to have you here. How, how are you? Thank you so much for having me here, Jody. I am great. Um, I think you are great. I will tell you, and I've said this to you before, from the second we met, um, we had a very quick conversation. We both cried. We did. (laughs) And I was like, we're going to be friends forever. (laughs) (laughs) And it's so true. And and, and even though we don't talk every single day or even a week, no matter what, it's just, yeah, we're kind of on that same wavelength. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm very grateful. We do. Thank you. We do meet incredible people on our journey. And sometimes we don't know how it happens or why it happens, but it happens. But it's so important, like the acknowledgement of it is, I think the gratitude brings more of that in our lives, right? I think so too. And I, I think that's that's what um, meeting people and, and connecting with them at different levels and on different parts of our path is what enriches our lives so much. And it's exactly what you said. We don't always know why we meet the people that we meet, but we always meet everybody for a reason, whether it's a big reason or, or a little reason there there's, you know, people come into our lives with a purpose. Oh, absolutely. And, and like you said, we don't, we don't always know what it is, but, and sometimes we never figure it out because it's just so great. So right. it just keeps going and just keeps going. But I want to read about your greatness mm-hmm. <laughs> that I ever read. Um, because this is always unscripted, which is what I love about the podcast. I thank my guests for allowing me to have the unscripted part. But I want, I'm going to read a little bit of Ivy's um, bio here. Okay. Ivy is an Emmy Award winning, let me say that again, Emmy Award winning executive producer and writer with more than two decades of experience. There's no way two decades. You look too young. I feel very old right now. <laughs> <laughs> Creating content for broadcast and digital media. Her extensive portfolio includes stories and specials that educate, inspire, and connect people. Ivy is also an experienced public relations expert with an emphasis on message identification and development. She's a keynote speaker who addresses audiences in a genuine, entertaining, and motivating way. She's a sought-after moderator. She has led discussions in front of live audiences on topics ranging from small businesses to women who were the first in their She's on the advisory board for Alaire Community Farm, which focuses on helping social, I'm sorry, special needs adults and children, teens facing mental health issues, veterans with PTSD, and families battling cancer. She also serves as the managing director of the Asbury Park Music and Film Festival, a nonprofit which provides music education to underserved kids in and around Asbury Park, New Jersey. She's also, wow, Ivy, there's even more here. You're a proud recipient of the 2012 Gracie Award 
for your work on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member Darlene Love. Ivy was honored as the 2018 Beacon of Hope Award winner for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of New Jersey for her work to raise money and awareness for blood cancer research. And Ivy started Kind Like Mike Day, which occurs annually on March 28th. The day encourages people to do random acts of kindness in honor of her brother, Michael, who passed away in 2004. Welcome Ivy again, wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a lot. That feels like I need a shorter bio, I think. <laughs> no, you know, and that's what everybody says when I read their bio, but I always say those words on paper are so small compared to the amount and amazing work that it takes to actually get to write those words on the page, right? It, it didn't happen in a day. It didn't happen in a week, a month, or even a year. You, you have two decades, it says, in their worth of work. It's, yeah. it's a long time. And it's funny too, because I love talking about what other people have accomplished and what other people have done. And like, that's like one of my favorite things to do is just to hear about like all the things that you, that you've done. And yet when to talk about myself, it's like, ugh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, but thank you so much for, for, for having me here and for, and for reading all that. I appreciate it. If you hear a little bit of a, of a dog in the background, it's because we're expecting some rain and I have a, a little, a 13 year old 10 pound Shih Tzu who doesn't like rain and who likes to make sure that I am aware that he doesn't like it when rain is coming. So, <laughs> so that's him. No problem. And if he makes an appearance, no problem. We, <laughs> we welcome children and animals, anytime. <laughs> significant others, whatever, whatever, whoever you in the picture. It's all good. It's all good. Yes, driver is going to be here in a few minutes too. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. But I want to go back to what you said, because it's so true, right? If <laughs> the work that you do, you're consistently highlighting others yeah. are doing great work, good work, stories that are important as an executive producer, but, but behind the scenes people who are making all of that incredible work happen, a lot of times they don't get to toot their horn and share their wonderful experience. So, um, you know, I appreciate you saying that because I, I think that's whether you're in that field or other fields, it's for some people, it's very hard to talk about themselves. Yeah. Yeah, but I actually think that it's um, not so much in talking about professional accomplishments, but in talking about the things that we experience in our lives and, and the things that, you know, I always say that in order to be in this moment that you're in right now, this very moment, everything that's happened to you in your life had to happen in the way that it happened. And that means all of the really great things, but also the things that weren't so great and the challenges that you had to face and the celebrations that you had, it's its literally everything. And so um, we like to talk about, or people like to share the times that they had something to celebrate, but it's a, a lot of times it's in those moments of challenges that we really define who we are. Um, mm -hmm. And we also gain um, experience that we can share with others that helps people get through their challenges. And so to me, that's the, the art and the beauty of storytelling is allowing people to feel that number one, making sure they understand that their life matters, that they matter, that they have value no matter, no matter what they do or, or who they are, they have value and their life matters, but also that the things that they go through they don't go through them alone, that other people experience those things too. And so many times when we're going through a challenge, we don't talk about it. And that's what makes it feel a little uh, more isolating and you feel a little more alone. And then when you hear that someone else is going through that or someone else went through that and this is how they went through it, it instantly changes. It, it, it's like a chemical change that happens when you realize like, oh, it's not just me. Someone else has also experienced this. Um, and, and that's what helps you get through it. I, and I love that part of storytelling. I think it's so powerful. Uh, yes. I, you know, what, what you're saying is exactly what I'm trying to do with this podcast, because, I, you know, I say I've said this before. The thing, the two words, judgment and vulnerability, if yeah. we we're able to be more vulnerable, which means that we could share our stories without the fear of judgment, the connection that we would all have with each other. Absolutely. Would be next level. Right. Right. And just the, then the, and the compassion we would have for each other and the understanding and the, um, you know, maybe, maybe the kindness we would have toward each other just by understanding, um, 
you know, the person that, that, that is standing in front of you, there's a whole backstory and you don't know what that is. And, and if we can just be a little kind to each other and a little understanding and become aware of the fact that we don't know everything that that person has been through. If you can, for me at least, when you, when you can see the world in that way, it just becomes a kinder place. Absolutely. So, you know, I lost my dad six years ago. His birthday's tomorrow, actually. And so um, he always said he practiced the religion of kindness. That was if you asked him. And I know that, you know, when I was just sharing that you have created the Kind Like Mike Day in honor of your brother um, who passed in 2004. Can you share what Kind Like Mike, what, what, because on March 28th, although we are not near that date right now, we will re-air this um, Thank you. <laughs> again during that timeline. But I just, I, you know, I think it's important because whether it's March 28th or not March 28th, I just think what you're, what you do during that day is so significant. Could you share? So uh, someone said um, that grief is love with nowhere to go. Um, and so for me, and then, and then there, I read something once that said, kindness is love with its work boots on. So if you put those things together, right? I love it. What better way um, to deal with grief? Um, we all deal with grief in different ways, but when we, when we deal with grief in a way that adds purpose, um, it's for me, it's a way to still carry on the legacy of love that we have for someone who passed. And, and I'm saying this to you, and this is exactly what you've done uh, with your dad's legacy. I mean, when you lose someone and you, and you love someone so much, what do you do with all of that love? But you find purpose in that. And in that purpose, you are now using the love of someone that you lost to spread love to others and spread kindness to others. And so for me, Kind Like Mike is a day of just doing, and I should say, because there are always people, there are people who say, well, you should do kind acts every day. It shouldn't just be one day a year. Well, yeah, duh, of course, you should do kind acts every day, <laughs> of course. But for me, Kind Like Mike became a day where it's just an organized effort just to do as many acts of kindness as possible and also gives me and my family and, and, and my friends and my brother's friends a chance to say his name, to say, we're doing this in honor of Michael Sharmatz. And he was a great guy and he died when he was young, but he was, he was this loving, kind guy who would literally give you the shirt off his back. And so well, this one day a year, everything we do, all the kindness we do is in honor of him. It's in his memory and it's a way for me of keeping his memory alive and, and still allowing people who never met my brother to say his name and to know um, that he existed. And, and we get to introduce new people to my brother every year. And, and so that's, that's part of uh, what kind like Mike has been. Plus, I mean, you know, birthdays were always such a big deal in my family. And, and when it's someone's birthday who has passed away, as you know, it's sort of like, what do you do with this day? Like, yeah. you know, it used to be such a big day of celebration. And now it's like, it's weird. You know, it's what, you know, it's sad. It's, you're not really sure what to do. And now on March 28th, at the end of the day, I go through the social media posts with my parents and we literally are still celebrating my brother's life because of all of these great, amazing, wonderful acts of kindness that have all been done in my brother's name. And some of them, I will tell you, some of them are huge. Uh, some of them are over the years, we've had people give um, dental work, don a dentist donated dental work to a woman who didn't have the money to pay for dental work she needed. Uh, we have someone who every year um, uh, funds a scholarship for a child in my brother's name. And those are all big, huge things. But one year we also had someone who she reached out to me. She said, you know, I, I don't really know what to do. And, and I, you know, I, I don't know how much I can do. So what I did was I, I went uh, through downtown Red Bank and people whose cars were expiring, you know, the meters were expiring. I just added quarters. And I'm like, that's exactly what this is. Like, that's perfect. It, there is nothing too small, like nothing too small, nothing too big. And it's just become a really fun, amazing day um, when it was a sad day. Wow. I always say I need to have tissues. <laughs> like, oh my God, you're touching my heart. I, I know this was the first year we knew about it. And we had some of our AOK performance group members doing some things and tagging kind like Mike. 
what an amazing, for, for anybody who's listening to this podcast who is unsure how to get through their grief, right? Um, and, and what you said, oh my gosh, about saying their name, right? That is because, because you feel like that their name will never go on, right? <clears throat> you know? And, but when you can get like for us, like, as you know, it's the Zach G. Applauder Kids Foundation. So the name is there and people were like, how do they say it? They still don't know how to say it, but we were not just going to make it smaller because it was convenient. Right. Right. It went convenient or not convenient. It was going to be his name. But for those out there who are dealing with grief, what an amazing idea to find some way to have their name shared by people they don't even know. Right. Like who would think of that? It was a brilliant idea, Ivy. And congratulations to you and your family for, for what you're doing to keep his memory alive and his name alive. And I, I just, I just, I wish I could give you a hug. It's just, oh, awesome. thank you. We will, we will. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just awesome. And so if that helps somebody, you know, grief is, um, it feels very lonely, right? Because everybody else's life is going on. Those who are not affected by the person who's not there anymore. Um, so I know that, but you're right. Doing things like this can at least continue to make us smile. Yeah. And the thing about grief too is, which is fascinating in a way, is everyone grieves differently. You know, there's no one set way for people to grieve. Um, and I, I've always found, you know, just from my own experience, um, when someone close to me loses someone that they love, um, it's always the check-in like two or three weeks afterwards. I think that's the most important because when you initially lose somebody, you're just surrounded by, by people. Um, and it doesn't really sink in until everyone goes back to their lives and everyone else goes back to their normal lives. And you're realizing what your new normal feels like. Um, and that's when it, you know, it really starts to feel the most painful, I guess. And, and so for me, you know, it's the, it's the two week check-in, uh, the two week, you know, I'm coming over the two week, what can I do to me that, that is, uh, that I've learned is just the, the most, um, th one of the kindest ways to reach out to someone who's grieving because that's, that's almost like the forgotten part of the process. Oh, I, I totally is. And my, when my father passed the, the funeral home was standing room only. I, I didn't know most of the people that were there. He had touched so many lives, yeah. but then they all disappeared. Yeah. It was, it was that day and the next day, you know, we'd be getting caught. And then it was kind of like you said, everybody just disappeared. And we looked at my sister and I looked at each other like, okay, well, we have each other. You know what right. I mean? Like you did, you know, you just try to find who in the family is right. through that same process with you. Um, so I think, and I think that um, if we don't go through our grief, though, I can definitely say this. I have cried in the grocery store listening to the overhead music in the frozen section, right? All of a sudden that song comes on. Do you know this one? You know, like that song comes on and you're in the frozen section and people are going to be looking at you like, why are you crying right now? So the grief process is tough and it's long. And I don't think there's a beginning or an end, you know, there's a beginning of when it happens, but there's not an end right. to what happens right. or an end, that, that feeling ends. So it's important to know that you have to go through the process because the more you push it down like a garbage bag, if you overfill, you know, it bursts at the seams. Yeah. And just so you know, if I, if we're ever in the supermarket together and I see, I like, bump into you crying in the freezer section, I'll start crying with you because that's what I do. So you'll never cry alone when you're with me. <laughs> I'm with you too. <laughs> we, well, and we'll never cry alone at all because I'll cry with you. You'll cry with me. There you go. Done. Done. Okay. But we're going to laugh. We're going to laugh too. We always, we, absolutely. Laughing is contagious too. And, um, I want to go back a little bit because I, I find the work that you do so interesting, right? Of course, because not the industry I'm in. And so I, I want to learn more about you and I want our audience to learn more about you. So where did you grow up? Tell it, grow up. Tell us a little bit about Younger Ivy. So I'm a Jersey girl through and through. I grew up in Westfield. Um, I went to Rutgers. I live in Monmouth County now. Um, I, I think that... Um, Years ago, I, I started thinking about how someone asked me, like, how did you decide to, you know, work in news or go into TV? Or, and I realized that it was actually my mom's father that sort of instilled this idea in me without realizing it. So all of my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. Um, and my mom's father um, was an orphan. And um, 
you know, hearing his stories and even as I got older, hearing them in more detail, it's amazing what a person can go through in their life and, and still survive. Um, but he was also the happiest, most loving person you would ever meet in your life. And everyone who met him just instantly, like they just loved him. He was just this like light. And I remember at one point being a little girl and it, I don't think it really meant I don't think I understood what it meant at the time, but I remember looking at him thinking like, everybody loves this man. He's like the life of the room always. But when you think about like what he went through, you would have no idea. And, you know, he, he chose to be a loving, happy person because he, it could have gone the other way. You know, he could have said everything I've been through in my life, like, you know, I'm going to be miserable and I'm going to, you know, hold on to this like hatred and fear and, you know, all these things, but he wasn't like that at all. And I think that there was a part of me that realized like you, like you don't, when you meet somebody, you have no idea like what, what happened to them to get them to this point. And as I got older, I, I think that fascination with just like, you know, who are you? Like what, you know, where, where, where did you come from? What's important to you? Like, why do you choose to do the things that you do? Just became just as natural curiosity me with everybody. I mean, I'm the person who like, you know, we talk about meeting in the supermarket, but like, I do just like to have random conversations with people just about like, oh, that's like, why are you like, what's going on? Like, you know, why, why would you do that? Um, and I, I think it part of that definitely comes from being my grandfather's granddaughter and and knowing you know what he um, what he had been through. I mean he he my this is one of my favorite stories of my grandfather. He uh, you know because he was an orphan he understood what hunger was right. Um, and he had a, a butcher shop in Newark, um, and he when he would see other when he would see kids who he recognized hunger in them he would ask them for help in the store and then feed them and that was the type of person that he was he'd be like oh i need help can you help me sweep this and oh because you remove these boxes oh here let me thank you by you know giving you some food or giving you a sandwich or whatever. and that's who he was um and and that has been a huge inspiration both in you know from finding out more about who people are to also just that always choosing that kindness um he's you know, been a, a big influence. He passed away many years ago. I was I was in sixth grade when he passed away, um, but just that idea of you know who he was, this larger than 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 life man, has just been a huge influence. That's incredible, Ivy. We have a lot more in common than I knew, because my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. Get out! I didn't know that. Uh huh. My father never met his father. Wow. And my mother's father was a butcher. Wow. <laughs> years he had a store um, in Brooklyn yeah so. my dad's father had a had a was also a butcher in Brooklyn <laughs> remember if we go back to the beginning of this conversation <laughs> you never really know why you meet the people that you meet <laughs> it just takes a podcast to yeah. make you realize all the other things you might have in common absolutely absolutely oh my gosh it's so funny what a small world Totally small world. So we'll have, we'll definitely have a lot more to talk yeah. about after this yeah. podcast for sure. For sure. Oh my goodness. So his influence gave you curiosity, definitely kindness. You definitely were able to, it sounds like you were able to see like how he turned a situation that he could have gone into a deep depression, right. gone inward. You know, we, the, there was a lot of trauma and right. it takes a very strong person yeah. push through the trauma to create you know, memories like he created with you because look, sharing those memories. So how did that then, and, and where'd you go from there as being that sixth grader? Let's talk about what encouraged you to move forward um, with getting into producing. Um, I had wanted to be a writer. That's just what I always kind of thought I would I would do. And then when I was in college, I, I had an internship with a TV station and I wrote something at four o'clock and a five o'clock, one of the anchors read it on TV. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> because I have, because typically like, you know, the stuff that I had done previous to that had been like writing for newspapers and, you know, and back, back in the day, mm -hmm. um, you know, you literally waited for the paper to print. Like it wasn't, you know, there was very, very beginning of online stuff, but like not, this is like a million years ago. Anyway. <laughs> We should crochet while we have this conversation. <laughs> um, but um, so it was like the instantaneous 
like I, I just thought it was so cool. And then the idea of being able to use video to help tell those stories and and uh, I think I, it, the bug just kind of um, the bug just kind of hit me, uh, you know, with TV and and TV has changed so much in the last. I mean, not to sound really like like I'm 147 years old, but TV <laughs> has changed so much in in the, in the past 20 years. But the idea of you know the very basic idea of TV as a platform for people to you know in the very in in the in the very best of of what TV could be where it's a, where it gives people a platform to, and and allows voices to be amplified to reach other voices i mean there's something about that 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 is just so intriguing mm -hmm. um, and so beneficial when it's used for good Sometimes yeah. <laughs> I was used for good, but when it's used for good, it, it's really so powerful. And I kind of feel the same way now about social media. Um, I mean, we could talk for three days about what's wrong with social media um, and and how um, it can be damaging. But the idea of people who may not have another way to amplify their stories, amplify their voices for them to have the control to be able to kind of just push your stories out there. I mean, how powerful is that? And, and how amazing is that? Again, when it's used for good, when it's used for good. Absolutely. Uh, and that is, that is the hard part is you have to be the person who picks apart what's the good and what's, you know, not so great. Right. It's hard because we get, we have a lot coming at us, right? There's, right. It's coming at us now, you know, because back then, and I was with you back then, <laughs> we, uh, we really, it was, it was, kind of more focused and now our attention span is what like three seconds when you especially on you know social media right. so it is hard to you can get sucked in very quickly too because they get if you if they get you in the three seconds you can get sucked into the things that aren't so great so it's really making sure that you make the right decisions on what's good and what's absolutely. not absolutely did you think you'd be doing this when you were younger um you know i thought I always kind of thought I'd be a writer. I thought maybe I would um, be a radio host. Is that a weird thing? I don't know why I always thought I, I thought maybe that was like something I used to um, have a fake talk show when I was a little girl. I had a, um, this is really turning into like a back in the day interview, but um, <laughs> I had like one of those um, like little tape players that had an antenna you know, like the, like the antenna and I would hit record on the tape and I would use the antenna as like my fake microphone and I would have a call-in show. Um, but I would be the host and the callers. And sometimes they would write letters and I would read the letters on the air. I think I was, I, the name I used was Dr. A. I was a doctor of something. Um, so I don't know this idea of like, like talking to so people, much. even if they were imaginary, uh, I, I guess was just something. I mean, I, I think I come from like a family of talkers. Um, so maybe it was just like, I knew I had to talk to somebody. Um, but I also, you know, like, like listening. And I have to say too, you know, my, my mom, um, um, my mom was always the person who like, if she heard someone making fun of somebody or like when we were little, like making fun of a kid or, or whatever, she would shut it down immediately. She'd always be mm -hmm. like, the way my mom would say it, you don't know what they have going on by them, which was her way of saying like, you don't like, you don't know what their story is. Like, why would you say it? And so that was something too. And so I think um, just the idea of, I, I, so I knew I wanted to do something where I, I was able to talk to people and, and, you know, learn from people and connect with people. That was something to me, I guess that, that whatever, whatever that, however that was going to, whatever that was going to turn into, I knew it had to do something with that. So you, you weren't you weren't a shy kid. Were you more outgoing? Oh, I was very shy. I oh, was very shy. Okay, okay. <laughs> it was it was just your radio. Show. I was I was very shy until I was like alone with the antenna microphone <laughs> and the cassette. Then I was like super outgoing. <laughs> but uh, no, but I was definitely shy. Um, I would say even through. So it's actually funny because I was very shy. I think I was very shy unless I was like working. So when I was um, in high school and I was working on our high school newspaper, like if I just saw you when I was young, I mean, now I, now I'll, I'll talk to anybody, but when I was younger, if I saw you, even if I like wanted to get to know you, I'd be like so shy. But if I was like coming with a question because I was working on the school newspaper, then I was like, hi, I need to like, you know, speak with you. Um, and so that 
in a way, I think um, having to interview people forced me to become a little more extroverted um, yeah. in a way. And and now I don't think I'm sh I don't think I'm shy. Um, although I still kind of I kind of feel like a shy extrovert, if that makes sense. <laughs> No, it does. It, it does. Make is that sense. a thing? I don't know. Did I just make that up? I don't know. But that's what I feel like. No, no. They, there is a such thing as an introvert extrovert. You know, yeah. there there definitely is. And I I was so super shy. I was like, please, you were? Oh my god. I was like, please, nobody look at me. I I literally, if I could have hit under the table, I would have hit under the table. I was scared of my own shadow. I was I was well. You know, I, I unfortunately, um, when I was younger. When I was thirteen. I I actually got beat up by a girl because yeah so it, it, you know it, that made it even worse right. because it was such a terrible situation but the thing about that is is that you know you don't want to be seen then you know you just right. want to hide under the table at that point point. and so that being said me thinking that I could even have a podcast or have you know where 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 I've been and I like sharing this kind of thing with our audience because for those who are watching who aspire to be outgoing and don't know how there's so many different ways it's actually start talking to those who are more outgoing and ask them what their tips and tools are what would you give them advice for those who really want to be out there but there's something stopping them from sharing who they are because they're afraid of judgment do you have any secret sauce that you'd share on that i think um i mean that's a great question and, and i think um People have different reasons why they're shy, so it, you know maybe it depends on on what's causing them to feel that shyness. But I think for me, just a, a great icebreaker is always just ask the other person about themselves. Like that, to me, is the best way to um, to to just start talking to someone and just you know kind of get out there. And in doing that, um, I mean even just. And you and I have talked like 8,000 times, but even just in this conversation, just from us talking, we're like, oh, me too. Oh, me too. Oh, me too. And that's, you know, how you can start. I, I think how you can start to feel comfortable with someone just by asking, ask people about themselves and then see if there's something that you can relate to. And then that kind of helps you, you know, get out of your, get out of your shell. But it is hard. I mean, um, because of what you said, the judgment and the vulnerability, right? If you, if you're a shy person, everything feels like judgment and everything feels like you're super vulnerable. So it's, it's definitely a, a challenge, but ask people about themselves. People love to talk about themselves. Oh, I say the Most same people. thing. Most people, people love to talk about themselves. So <laughs> they're talking about themselves and you know, that, that's, that's at least, at least it's a conversation starter. Absolutely. I say the same thing when people say that, when I, people ask me, I don't know how you do it. I said, I just ask people about themselves yeah. and nobody runs out of the, you know, that, that gets them excited because they want exactly. to. Exactly. So tell us about a day in the life of an executive producer. Hmm. One of the things that I love uh, is that there is, every day can be a little, every day can be a little different. Um, and so sometimes it's, um, you know, booking segments uh, based on, on things that are happening in the news. Um, sometimes it's working on specials that, that are focused on um, specific issues. Um, or topic. Sometimes it's um, going out in the field, and that's my favorite. My favorite is is being in the field with people, um, and uh, you know, doing interviews and and doing some editing. So every day is is definitely different. But at the at the sort of baseline of every day is what stories are we going to tell today, and how are we going to tell those stories, and how are we going to you know, inform people and really connect people with with other people. I mean, when I think about um, this story, keeps coming to my mind, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this. Yes, but please. many years ago, um, we I happened to meet someone um, who uh, they it, it was a couple, and they have a son with special needs, um, and he's in his 40s now. But they realized when he was 18 that he was aging out of all of the programs that were available to him and how lonely he was becoming because when you're an adult, a young adult, especially with special needs, there aren't necessarily places for you to interact with your peers. And so um, they created an organization called the Circle of Friends that they're actually based in Monmouth County now. Uh, and they, 
you know, have these events and, and it's they're, they're uh, on Facebook. And, you know, so they, they have these events where it, they have dances and it, just things where people can come together and they just, they don't feel judged and they just, you know, have this great time. So anyway, we do this story and the woman who uh, runs the program um, called me, I guess it was about two hours after the story first aired. Um, and she was crying and she said, um, we've had people call saying, thank God for this. Pro I didn't know this pro that this program existed. We've been looking for something for, you know, our adult child, how this is going to like change our lives, knowing that this is there. And I started crying too, because, you know, in that, that's really, to me, what this work is all about is, is giving people an opportunity to connect with people and, and, and helping them feel that they're not alone. Oh. You're, you're trying to make me cry today. <laughs> But multiple times I do understand that because we've, you know, we've been featured on different news stories ourselves, you know, the AOK performance group has been out performing and what, or, and we talk about the scholarships we give, and then all of a sudden we'll get a call or an email and you're like, you, you are, you know, you are so grateful to the news for giving that outlet for the child and for, for and the parents are grateful. So the stories that are shared when it's used for good, like you said, yeah. be life-changing. Yeah. And I, I think that there is a, um, I think that for some of us in this business, um, we hold that responsibility very highly. Um, you know, there's all different, there's all different types of storyteller, all different types of people who work in news for all different reasons. Um, but my favorite people in this business are the ones who understand the responsibility that comes with doing this type of work. And, you know, when someone, when you tell someone's story, when someone hands that over to you, it's a huge responsibility. Um, and it's also an honor. And there's a certain reverence, I think, that has to be given to that process because um, that's, you know, there, there's no greater honor or responsibility, I think, than, than, than being tasked with telling someone's story. Well, thank goodness for people like you who have the heart <laughs> to want to share the stories from the goodness of what, what's happening out in the communities that these organizations serve. And it's not self-serving to you. It's about making a difference in the world. Yeah. Although the one self-serving part I will say is that I can't, you know, I get to meet people like you and then we become friends. So mm -hmm. I do, I do, that is my little uh, <laughs> bonus, I guess, <laughs> that I get. <laughs> yes. And it's a bonus for all of us as well. Uh, so that we're, we're great. We're grateful for that, but I can't imagine that there's challenges sure. here and there. So what would you say one of the biggest challenges in your industry is in your role, in your position? Um, I think some of it is it's impossible to, to do everything we want to do. Um, you know, there are so many reasons. There are so many factors that go into choosing the, the stories that get told. Um, and there have certainly been times where we had a great story plan. We were going to, you know, go to some great event and, and, and then some horrific breaking news happens. And then, you know, that, that stuff can't happen. So I think the idea of just, you know, there's an infinite number of stories that can be told and, 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 a, and a, you know, so many people um, that, that we could feature and that doesn't always happen. Um, and I think also, um, just in the way that the industry is is sort of changing and and the idea of um it being harder to capture people's attention sometimes um because there are so many places now um for people to watch or people to connect or you know whatever it is um and and so that's definitely a, a little bit um a little bit of a challenge um, but I don't, I don't focus on those things. I focus on the idea that, you know, uh, there, there's so much that there's so much that we can do. There's so much good that I, that I hope we are doing. And I've always been lucky because even though I work in the news business, I've never really worked in hard news. I've always been able to do the community type pieces and the, and the, um, the pieces that, that I think relate the most to just everyday, um, everyday people. Yeah, because that connection provides those that connection. Yeah, that connection provides that vulnerability that provides for right. them, and that's and that's what people want. They want yeah. to hear relatable stories that can say, "Me too." Like you said before, that's right. Like, 
that, you know, people want to raise their hand and say, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. I just did a, I just did a, a speaking opportunity and I got an email afterwards saying, oh my gosh, everything you were saying resonated with me. Mm-hmm. It made me feel it. I started to tear up because I didn't, you, you know, sometimes you can't tell the audience what's happening. And especially this person had their camera off. So I had no idea. Gotcha. So, you know what I'm saying? So you, you know, in, in the news situation, you don't know who's behind, uh, you know, looking at the t- watching their TV and then all of a sudden that story relates to them. And so it makes a difference. Ivy, what is the, what is the mark you want to make in this world? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, mean, um, I have a feeling you might. I, I think, um, I think if we can, I think if I, if there's, it's so hard to talk about me in terms of, I'm, you know, I'm so bad about talking about myself, but I, I think though, if, if, if I can do anything um, to sort of make the world a better place, and I say this very humbly, but if, if, if I can give people, um, make them feel comfortable sharing what they've been through in their life and that that uh, then allows other people to feel comfortable with what they've been through in their life. I mean, I, I actually think that one of the um, the meaning of life in a way is that, you know, we go through things so that then we can help people go through those, those same things. Um, and in order for us to do that, we have to share what we've been through um, and which is, which is hard to do. So if I can do anything and, and it's to, um, you know, allow people to feel safe and comfortable talking to me and then allowing me the opportunity to help amplify that for other people, um, then I think that's a pretty good uh, thing to, to have done. And, um, and, and also I think just to, just to um, help people realize that they have more control over their life than they think they do um, because we don't control everything that happens in life, but we always have the ability to control how we react to those things. And by sharing how we react, again, we're able to help inspire and, and you know, kind of lend a hand to people who, who might need a little help getting through something. You're such a light. You know that? You truly are. You're such a light. And, and speaking about yourself, I know is hard. And, and thank you for even sharing that because I think it, it helps others to realize that it's okay to do it. Like almost sometimes we have to, people feel like, do I have permission? Is it being selfish if I share about the things that are good about me? We've been brought up that, you know, there's, there's two types of people, people who are, they say conceited or those who are selfless, right? But there, there's, what happened to the middle? The right. middle is we're proud of who we are. Right. That doesn't mean we're selfish right. or conceited. Right, right. And I, I think being, you know, and I, we touched on this before, but I think being proud of who you are is is honoring and respecting everything that's happened to you up to this very point. And so I, I think that that you sort of have to be proud of who you are in order to move forward in, in your life with whatever you're going to do. Absolutely, without a doubt. So two more quick questions. One is women moving up the ladder, right? It's, it's a very important topic, um, you know, and, and there's, for some... They, they don't know how, and they feel stifled. For, for others, they're, they're, they're trying to, they're going kicking and screaming. Um, what message do you have for women who are starting out right now in careers um, that you wish you knew maybe when you were starting out? I think um, for women specifically, um, for all people, but I think for women specifically, you know, working hard and being professional are great obviously that's you know we all need to do that but we also need to remain our authentic selves and the value that we you know when we try to fit in um or become something that we're not we are devaluing who we are um and the reason why we need more women and more diversity in every room is because we need those life experiences and those perspectives to give us a complete picture. And when we hide parts of who we are in order to fit in or in order, you know, we think like, oh, we need to, you know, like be one of the boys or, or whatever it is. We are basically saying that my experiences as a woman don't matter. I'll leave them at the door just so I can sit at this table. 
And I think we need to embrace that more and realize that the fact that we might see things differently or that we've had different experiences makes us amazing. It doesn't, it doesn't take away from anything. It adds and it should add to the conversation. And I think being in a room where people appreciate that is what really helps move this ball forward. Um, and so, you know, young women, yes, work hard. Yes, be professional. Yes, you know, you know, take every opportunity you can, but always, always stay true to who you are because that is what will make you a valuable part of any team that you're on, no matter what you're doing. It is so true that we sometimes try to come to the table being what we think the people around the table want us to be. Right. Guess what? We have no idea really what they want. No, no. And we're not good at that. You know, no matter, no matter how much we try, um, you know, and I think about, I'm sure you've had this too, you know, uh, over the course of my career, how many women I've seen who, um, who you can tell are trying to fit in and not be their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, especially when you're a young woman and you see that it's like, it's like, it, it, it's heartbreaking in a way, because as a woman, you want to be able to relate to another woman who's in, you know, who's in a position of power and who is still being true to themselves and not, you know, women, I think some women, I think tend to tend to be the yesers in the room because they want to, they still want that seat at the table. And so rather than, uh, you know, speak their, their mind, they just kind of say, yes, 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 because they, they want, and now again, I don't want to generalize. This is, you know, of yeah. course, of course, you of course. know, it's not always true, but especially years ago, when I think about, you know, coming up, um, I know that there were women who, who, who did that. And I did not want to, I did not want to be that person at all. Yeah. They, they're trying to conform to what they think the expectation is. Um, and then they lose themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think we, I know for myself, I'll speak for myself. I think I tried to do that at one point in my mm -hmm. career because I thought that was what we were supposed to do, you know, as a woman. And because some of the women I looked up to as I was growing in, in the field I was in, they were doing that. So what do we do when we look up to someone? We try to do the same. as Absolutely. Everyone. But then I wasn't feeling authentic anymore. Right. I have to say the unfortunate part is it happened later in, in my life that I, I stopped trying so hard to do that. But I'm glad now I can share, like you said before, I could share that experience with others that when you do that, you're not being true to yourself. Right. Right. And I'm sure, um, I mean, how did you, when you realized that you didn't have to be anyone other than yourself, how did you feel? You must've felt free. Yeah. 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 Like a weight that right. was, was like this million pound gorilla that you're carrying. Like when you decide, well, I don't know if it's age that does it. I hate to say that. I don't know if it's age that does it. might be Jody. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, you can like me, you like me, you don't like me, you like me, but this is who I am and I can't change me. And I'm, and if we try to be, rep, you know, um, you know, replicate each other, then why are we look different? Why are we, di we're, we're all so different. We're supposed to bring something different to the table. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and acknowledging that I think is important. And, um, and as women, um, who are a little further along, we'll say, Jody, um, <laughs> I think, I think it's important, you know, I always, when I, when I am working with, um, you know, young women, I always try to make it a point to make sure that they feel comfortable being themselves, um, whether it's in a pitch meeting or uh, whatever it is that, you know, what do you think? Not what do you, what, not what do you think you need to think? What do you think about this? Like, do you think this is important? How would you feel about, you know, that, that kind of thing, which is just, um, you know, I kind of wish someone had, had done that for me. Yeah, absolutely. I actually start a lot of my meetings with, this is a non-judgmental space. So whatever, whatever idea you have, put it on the table because all of them matter and all of them count and there's not a stupid idea. What I don't like is when people say, oh, there's no stupid questions and there's no stupid ideas. But as soon as you ask the question, they make a face. Right. As if to say, well, that was a stupid question. There should never be a, if you're, if somebody has a question, even if you think, well, didn't I answer that before? That means that person didn't, wasn't able to, you know, comprehend right. whatever reason. Right. So you need to back up sometimes, and and with patience and understanding, 
we can allow people to be, as we said before, vulnerable. And I always say too, there's no bad ideas in brainstorming. I mean, you need, you need a storm of ideas and a lot of them are going to be bad. I say that a lot of these ideas are, I mean, there's no bad ideas, but a lot of them aren't going to work. And that's, you need all the ideas that aren't going to work in order to get to the idea that that is going to work. So no bad ideas in brainstorming, just, you know, don't be afraid to share. Absolutely. Absolutely. So last question of the interview, okay. I know we, we kind of touched on it, but I, I think you can even expand on anything else in your life. I ask everybody the same question. You know, you knew then what you know now, what would that be? So I know that you always end this uh, <laughs> with this question. And so I actually was, was thinking about it and it's funny because I, I kept came, coming back to this idea. There's so many ways to answer this right there. I feel mm -hmm. like this could be a whole conversation, like a whole separate conversation. <laughs> um, but I think there's, there's um, the, if, if I could go back and, and share one thing with my younger self, it would be to feel peaceful mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, when no matter what's happening around you, if you can kind of remain in this place of calm and peace um, and you'll react better to things, you'll make better decisions um, and you you won't waste the time or the energy, you know, being frantic or, or being upset about something that really you have no control over. And I think that this idea of this, like, you know, maybe it's a little too stoic, I don't know, but this idea of, of just, you know, remaining peaceful inside of you definitely changes how you see the world. You know, Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way uh, you look at things, the things you look at change. And I think that's so true. What, you know, we, that when you look at things from a, from a peaceful place, from a, from, from this idea of, you know, whatever happens, we're going to get through this. We're going to be okay. It's might, it might suck for a little while, but it'll be okay. You know, this is all part of our journey. I, I wish I would have had this calmness, um, you know, 20 years ago, but it's, I, I, it's okay that I didn't because I appreciate it now so much more, <laughs> you know, having not had it. Um, but I think, you know, and, and it's not, it's not a necessarily an easy thing to do, but if, if you, um, for me, working on that and, and getting to the point where, you know, things happen and it's like, all right, well, now we need to figure out what step two is. It just It just feels better to me. That's, that's a beautiful thing, that peace, that word peace, right? Internal peace. Yeah. So um, I started a book club because I wasn't busy enough. So I started a book club <laughs> um, and we're reading the book called What Happened to You? I don't know. If you've heard, you know, the Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Perry book, mm -hmm. one of the things, and I'm a, you know, I'm also a certified professional coach. And one of the things that I didn't know was that um, when you are in a stressful situation or in a fear situation or overwhelmed, our IQs are lowest or mm -hmm. at, at, are at their lowest wow. in that situation. So think about how many times we make decisions in those states of mind, right? But they talk about when you're at your calmest how you get your best ideas, right? And I know that's true, right? Right. So that peace opens up a whole new world. It's finding how to get there. But just the thought of the fact that when we're making decisions, do we want to make them when our IQ is at our lowest? Right. right. And sometimes I think even if we, you know, getting to a peaceful point or to a peaceful state can be difficult, but I think sometimes just the acknowledgement that that's what you want helps helps bring you closer to it um so it's okay if it's not perfect but just realizing like okay this is i'm this i don't want to be in this state right now i need to like calm myself down uh that in and of itself for me at least i think that kind of helps just to calm the situation too yeah. find your confidant that person you can vent yeah. to go on and listen to wayne dyer or go read over the book or whatever it's go whatever it is for you i Hey, listen, I'm not ashamed to say sometimes I'll do adult paint by number. It looks great when it's done, but you know, it's very silly, but it puts me in my flow. Like whatever puts you in your flow, music is what you connect to when you're in those places. It's finding that connection. But just real quick, is there something that puts you in your flow? Like when you're feeling a little overwhelmed? Well, I, one of the things that has been, uh, and I've been very fortunate to work from home during, during the pandemic and my dog has been this like 
I mean, I, I can't even describe when you have a stressful day or not even a stressful day, you have like a stressful, you know, moment or something and being able to just take literally like three minutes of a timeout and just, you know, pet your dog or hold your dog or whatever that has been, um, that has been huge for me, but I, I will tell you, I don't really, I don't know why I'm sharing this with you, but I will say that when I'm having a really, really bad day, like, Oh, like, Oh my God. Like, you know, everything is like, I don't know how I'm gonna get everything done. I will go to, um, Dunkin', uh, like a Dunkin' Donuts drive through or something and I will, you know, get a coffee or whatever, but then I pay for the person behind me and that immediately changes, you know, like a random person that immediately changes my mindset. Um, and just makes me, um, it, it just, it just changes everything. It just changes everything for me. And it's, um, you know, it, it's just a small way I think where I just feel like, okay, I'm back to being me. And now let's take on whatever else is, is coming our way. We've come full, full circle, I think on the conversation, because we started with, you know, talking about kind like Mike yeah. and now just, that's what brings you back to yeah to yourself is, is that kindness, that putting that kindness out there. That that's amazing. And there's a, a Dunkin' Donuts that had someone pay it forward each car up to a hundred. It was a hundred. I saw that. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That was just incredible. Because that's the thing about kindness. Kindness begets kindness. You know, when you, when someone, when you feel kindness, um, you want to share kindness. And so, you know, we could always use more of that. Absolutely. Ivy, thank you for sharing your, your kind, your light with this world, with me, sharing your stories. I learned so much more about you <laughs> through this podcast. <laughs> Jody, thank you so much. I have to tell you, your podcast and, and the work that you're doing, and you know how much um, I admire you as a person and, and, the, and the work that you do, but the fact that you have created uh, this platform and that you do it in a way with such genuine love um is is just an amazing it's an amazing thing so congratulations on all of these wonderful interviews that you've done because you are really um you're speaking to people in a way that really matters and you're and you're putting that out into the world and so thank you for thank you for doing that absolutely now you are making me cry <laughs> sorry <laughs> but you have to come back i promise all i right. promise okay good because we need more of your light in this world and I'm, I'm grateful for our friendship and I'm I, very grateful for our friendship too. Thank you for your time, Ivy. We, I so appreciate it. And um, take a look, Ivy's on LinkedIn and you can find her there and, you know, and also go to our Facebook page and our Instagram page. Today's the day live it um, is both of the, you can follow us there, but also there is a today's the day change makers Facebook page. So please feel free to go on there and we just want to continue to bring change into this world and connect more people. And again, Ivy, thank you so much. Thank you, Jody. But I say at the end of every single podcast, today is the day. You cannot go back to yesterday and you do not yet own tomorrow. So what small or large steps are you going to take today to make a difference in your life? Have a great day, everybody. Bye, Ivy. Bye, Jody. Bye-bye. <laughs>